So there I want to segue into kind of another author who I teach a lot in my seminars on education, um, an Italian named Luigi Giussani. And his book mm. is called The Risk of Education. It's yeah. a short book. Uh, about 100 pages long. It just was released with a new uh, translation and a new introduction from Stanley Harwell. So I would also highly recommend this book to anyone listening to this, The Risk of Education. And he focuses, I think, very squarely on the point that you just made, that we're self-transcendent. And he talks a lot about education, about what does it mean to actually understand human experience and the desire for the infinite and for beauty and for goodness. But he also talks about, and here's what I wanted to ask you. He says, hey, you know, why don't we take these questions about the nature of the human person and open them up for rational debate, as you have been describing, right? But he says to do this, teachers really should acknowledge that they're starting that debate from a particular tradition, from a starting point. Yeah. So I wonder if you could comment on that because tradition is a word that in the United States, you know, we tend to like want to answer every question ourselves and make it ourselves. So tradition, what's the role of tradition in education? Well, here I've learned a lot from the philosopher Alistair uh, McIntyre. I have a lot of uh, regard for Jasani. Uh, but I have not been a careful student of uh, Jasani, and it might be that McIntyre is simply replicating here uh, what Jasani uh, said years earlier. But McIntyre, uh, who's a contemporary uh, philosopher, uh, Catholic convert uh, who teaches at uh, Notre Dame, but a very important figure for his entire adult life, really, in uh, a modern secular philosophy, McIntyre makes the point that there is no view from nowhere. There is no neutral vantage point, no Archimedean point from which we assess great questions, great existential questions or philosophical uh, questions. We're always coming from a standpoint and we're shaped by traditions of thought that supply things like language and concepts that enable us to think at all, especially about important questions. Uh, you'll be brought up in a particular uh, tradition. Parents who try to bring up their kids uh, in, uh, in no tradition fail. They actually do end up bringing up their kids in a certain tradition. They impart certain understandings, concepts, ideas, presuppositions uh, to their uh, children. They're fooling themselves if they think they're simply raising their children neutrally. They're not doing anything of the kind. Uh, they've created a tradition of their own in which they want to raise the, raise the kid. But kids will be brought up in one tradition or another. Now, uh, that tradition will enable them, whether it's a secular tradition or a religious tradition, a philosophical tradition, a, 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 a set of ideas, a worldview. Uh, the, the, that tradition, whatever it is, will enable the child to begin thinking about questions. Uh, and he'll uh, encounter uh, some of the answers that the tradition itself supplies to questions, including great questions. So a Jewish child or, a, or a, a, a Protestant child or a Catholic child or a Muslim child or a Buddhist child or a child raised under, say, Cuban communism or Chinese communism in that form of secularism or a child raised by secular progressive or secular humanist parents is going to have certain answers that are supplied uh, to certain questions. Uh, he might or might not uh, find those as he continues to think about them himself, might or might not find them satisfactory. McIntyre notes that often it's the case that uh, operating from a certain tradition, perhaps the tradition in which one was brought up, one begins to notice that the tradition itself generates questions that the tradition itself cannot provide satisfactory answers to. So that it's the, it's the tradition itself that enables you to raise the questions, but then you notice that the tradition itself doesn't provide the resources for answering the questions. At this point, McIntyre says, and this is in his uh, book, Whose Justice, Which Rationality? At this point, he says, you go into, the person goes into an ep epistemological crisis. You've got an important question, a question that your tradition sets for you. It's led you to ask, but it doesn't provide the resources to answer. At that point, you begin to look for alternatives. And this is how conversions happen, whether they're religious conversions or more broadly conversions of worldview, that you begin now to find the tradition you're in to be unsatisfactory on its own terms. 
and you look elsewhere to see if you can find an alternative approach, alternative tradition, that will answer those questions, that's capable of generating those same questions, presenting those same questions, shaping them, rendering them addressable, that can at least give coherent, decent answers to the questions. McIntyre himself is a person who's been through several uh, conversions. Uh, before he became a Catholic, I think he was a uh, he was a logical positivist and a Marxist or pseudo-Marxist, and uh, uh, he may have began, begun as some sort of uh, uh, Protestant, uh, Irish Protestant, I believe. Um, so he's been through this process himself. So he, he arrives at these reflections just reflecting on his own personal journey. But that squares certainly with my uh, impression of how things work and, and indeed with, with my own personal experience. I haven't ever been through a religious conversion. When I had my uh, encounter with Plato, my life altering encounter with Plato, uh, it did make me rethink everything. So suddenly everything was on the table. All the stuff that I thought I believed, all the commitments I thought I held, I, I suddenly felt it was necessary and exciting to study all those. Some of the beliefs that I had grown up with and held uh, just come to pick up, maybe with the ambient culture, um, I no longer could affirm. Uh, they didn't make sense to me anymore. Uh, I, I was converted away from them. Others, in my case, my religious beliefs became stronger. I actually thought the case for what I believed religiously as a Catholic was stronger than I had thought it was uh, prior to actually beginning to, to raise those questions. So my politics changed a good deal. My religion deepened rather than rather than rather than changed but it's it's in those experiences of questioning of raising questions of looking for the resources to answer those questions that the development whether it's conversion or not strictly speaking that development happens thank you so much robbie that was really eloquent i will just say that again um in jasani in his book the risk of education i think an image that captures what you just described he says tradition is like a backpack. Everybody comes into school carrying their books and their pencils and this, but their tradition is also a backpack. It's this set of presuppositions and understanding of the human person of the world. And part of what we need to do in education, this is why he says it's a risk, because you talked about it. We need to unpack what's in that backpack and we need to put it out for rational examination. And doing that is a risk. It's a risk. Oh, that is so true. I'm so glad you brought that up, Margarita. This is a point that in uh, the public dialogues and in the classes I've been teaching with uh, my dear friend Cornell West, we really emphasize that when you open your mind, when you do learning in a serious way, when it's not just the acquisition of skills or bits of information, but when you're really truth seeking, when that's what you've committed yourself to, you're in a risky field because you don't know where this inquiry is going to lead you. You don't know who you're going to be at the end of it, if there ever is an end of it, uh, because it's a lifelong, learning is a lifelong business. So, you know, you, you take a certain existential risk in doing that, because we do tend to wrap our emotions rather tightly around our convictions. And if this is our beliefs or the beliefs that we were raised in, we wrap our emotions pretty tightly around them, and we're afraid of changing them. We're afraid of being forced to change them by the power of reason or the logic of the thing or the evidence that's presented. So you take a risk when you open yourself up to truth seeking. We're going to consider the evidence. We're going to consider the, the logic. Uh, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's unsettling, as Brother Cornell says. It's unsettling. A good education is unsettling. And this is my job as a teacher and your job, Margarita, as a teacher and Cornell's job as a teacher to unsettle our students, to get them into the truth seeking mode. And that's a dangerous, risky business. It could disrupt our emotions, it could, it, because we do wrap them around our convictions. If our convictions turn out on reflection, maybe to be not fully warranted, or maybe we should think something else, it could cost us friendships, it could, it could damage our family relationships. And uh, of, of course, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave us with an identity issue, <laughs> yeah. because we do tend to identify with our beliefs. Some of our beliefs are, are identity forming. And this is something that I wish more students who are falling victim to the ideology I call identitarianism would, would consider. Uh, even our most cherished identity forming beliefs are on the table once you've made the commitment to truth seeking.